Tim, I think you're muted. Thank you so much. Welcome to the webinar. <laughs> My name is Tim Sarowitz. I'm the VP of Education and sometimes Zoom user. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about Gen AI and coding. I'm joined by Jerry Lozano, who is an outstanding trainer, teaches such a wide range of topics. It's really amazing to me, and I work in this industry all the time. So without further ado, let me uh, toss the mic over to Jerry. Would you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yes, thank you, Tim. So again, just call me Jerry as we go through the Q&A or, or if you're on mic at any point. Uh, first of all, just a couple of tidbits about me. I'm an electrical engineer by discipline, but I've been doing software development and a little bit of hardware development, well, ever since college. And trust me, as you can see, that was a long time ago. Uh, I mostly specialize in system level software languages. For the last 10 years, I've been in uh, uh, cloud development with microservices and uh, AI of, of late, right? Because uh, AI and ML are the big things now. Anyway, that's a little bit about me. And welcome to this uh, presentation, this webinar on Gen AI and coding. So we're going to take a look. Let me show you what our agenda is for the next hour or so. A little bit less because we're going to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, first of all, I want you to understand uh, what the range of tools are for the different IDEs and the different languages that are out there. What sort of coding assistance can I expect to get depending on my IDE and the tool that I choose? So we'll uh, uh, take a look at that. We uh, want to see how we use prompts so that we can actually generate good, effective, efficient code. And this will primarily be uh, uh, demos. Yes, the slides will back me up, but uh, I will be demonstrating how the prompts actually work to generate real code. And then we'll finish the presentation by talking about, well, what can go wrong, right? Things like hallucinations, where the uh, AI tool, the AI engine, will make things up and give you bad code. You'll just get bad code that doesn't work. And in obviously, the worst situation is it give you, gives you code that mostly works, but still has bugs in it. How do I look out for that, what things should I watch out for? So that's what we have on store for today. But if we start with a quick audience poll, so now that you've seen the outline, we've, we've given you what we're gonna talk about. Can you answer a quick poll question about your background? That would help me sort of understand, maybe I can uh, gear the, the explanations a little bit differently based on what your backgrounds are. So Tim, do you wanna conduct the poll? Uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the, the questions are, what is your background? You get a couple options here and it may not be perfect for exactly where you are, but find the one that's closest to what you think. So whether it's programming or a manager of that, uh, something in the SRE or support area, program management, data science or research. And of course, there's other popular areas that AI is, is going into, such as finance, HR, or perhaps something else. I think we've given them a little bit of time to, I'm excited about this, I, especially the hallucination part, that, that always sounds interesting to me because we all use AI now, how do I know when it's telling me the truth? So I'm, I'm excited to, to keep watching. Probably give them enough time to, to take the poll down and then keep rolling. I'm not sure if we'll see the answers to that. Oh, here it comes. Here it is. So, okay, most people are programming or manager of programmers. Okay, that's... That's a, a nice mix plus uh, others. So this is this is a great uh, group of people yeah. to be talking to. Yes, it looks like the backgrounds of people exactly fit sort of what the slides assumed. So I think we've got a good fit here. So thank you for that, everyone. All right. So uh, uh, moving on from here, let's get started, right? What are the tools that I can expect to see today, right? Well, let's start with this, right? Just a little quick overview of this. Um, Obviously, you can tell from looking at the video there that I've been through uh, this industry for a few years, been through the ringer, shall we say. And I've seen a number of revolutions, a number of major shifts in the way that we develop code. I mean, not an inclusive list, but here are just a few of the things that I've seen in my career. For example, the introduction of object-oriented programming, you know, using objects and methods and so forth. I mean, that was a big shift in the way we started to code, right? Data plus its code all bound together. The use of IDEs with variable completion. All of a sudden, it made sense to start using descriptive variable names because I had a tool 
that could fill in the long variable names every time I started to type it, right? Uh, so whether it was a, a Visual Studio or Eclipse, we all started to depend on the line completion, the variable completion name uh, that we got from these IDEs. It changed the way we coded. Big shift that often gets overlooked is just Google search. When I first started, uh, we would interview people based on their knowledge of algorithms. It was perfectly acceptable or reasonable to ask a candidate, uh, can you explain to me the difference between a quick sort and a bubble sort, for example? We tested their algorithmic knowledge. Well, that changed, right? Once Google uh, uh, searches got to be just prolific, Today, what good does it do to know what those are? You got that question, you just type it into Google and you can see the code, you can copy and paste code. It changed the way we program, the way we do testing, another revolution, right? We started to formalize our testing process. For example, test-driven development, writing the unit tests before we write the code, right? Making it part of the developer responsibility. This is a big shift. Than depending on SQA to do that. These are all revolutions, and there are many more that have occurred in our industry over just the last 20 plus years. Well, here's where we are today, right? We have generative AI in front of us, acting as a coding assistant, acting as a code generator for us. And these tools promise more radical change than maybe all the others put together. It's certainly another shift. It's certainly another revolution. Here's an example. Just last week, uh, Google publicly stated that 25% of the code that they develop at Google is now AI generated. Sundar announced that in the uh, quarterly earnings call that he did. So you can put a link down there where you can read more about that. But that's where we are today. And that of course is going to only increase as time goes by. Look, it comes to this. We have to learn how to use these tools these coding assistants, right, using AI. We have to be just as productive, just as efficient, just as good as our other peers, right? Look, if everybody else building the house is using an air hammer and we're, we show up with a manual hammer, we're not going to stay on that job very long. Another point, we went from zero to 25% in just the last two years. Where are we going to be two years from now or, or even less? It's less, right? The obvious statement to make here is that we need to get good at this. We need to understand what the tools do, right? And, and we need to be able to use them at least as well as our peers and our competitors, right? Valuable programmers need to be able to do this. So what can I do? What can we do over the next, what's left of this, say 45 minutes to help us with that statement that I just made? The answer is, you know, you, I want to be able to answer your question. How can I use Gen AI in my coding environment? Um, we, we need to be able to see what these tools can actually do. Let's look at them in action. Um, let me give you some advice on how the way you construct a prompt for these coding assistants is, makes all the difference in the world. You want better output, provide better instructions, better questions for the AI coding assistant. And I can give you those tips. And then what to watch out for, things like hallucinations or just bad code that gets generated, okay? And, and how to minimize those kinds of problems. That's what my goals are for the next 45 minutes. Let's see how this is gonna work. Let's do our quick survey of the tools that are available for your, your environments that are out there. First of all, most of us program with an IDE today, an integrated development environment. And, and all the popular IDEs have extensions for coding assistance. For example, IntelliJ, right? The product, uh, uh, IntelliJ IDEA and PyCharm for that matter, the product from JetBrains has several plugin options. Uh, they have GitHub Copilot as a plugin, right? It's a multi-language AI plugin, obviously from GitHub and Microsoft. JetBrains itself has a couple of coding assistants. They have Code With Me. It was one of their uh, earlier 
AI plugins for, for uh, the JetBrain, JetBrains IDEs. And today they have AI Assistant, which is, uh, you, you know, their, their very best attempt at this. This is still in development, but it's a great product. For Visual Studio Code, obviously, once again, we have GitHub Copilot. By the way, this is a collaboration with OpenAI and GitHub and Microsoft. Amazon has a product called Code Whisperer, right? It's an AI assistant. It's a little optimized for AWS API. So if you're programming with the cloud in AWS, this might be a good uh, extension for you. Tab9, and there are many others here that offer things like code completion tools, a focus on code completion, but Code completion on steroids, this supports many languages, lots of different IDEs. If you have to switch, if you're looking for something that's very agnostic and say not optimized for Amazon, tab nine would be something you would look at. Okay, so um, uh, let's focus a little bit more on a couple of these like GitHub hey, Copilot. Gary, before you go on, there was a poll sure. up and I'm not sure if people were fill filling that poll out or not. Um, that uh, we can see what that was real quick. The the poll had popped up. And oh, I see. Let's, let's take a quick look at it. So from the ones that you covered and what other people have said, it looks like uh, GitHub is leading, which I'm I'm not terribly surprised by. Uh, something else and none of the above. Well, I'm a little surprised about the none of the above. Honestly, thirty nine percent. You know, of course, I'm, I'm here talking to you because I'm a big fan of of AI. So that's part of it. There's a there's a bias there. But uh, what do you make of those results? So, so I look at that. I'm not surprised at all about GitHub Copilot. I have a slide. Well, look, it's right in front of us. Perhaps the most popular AI assistant, right? And, and this poll would support that. Not that it's all that representative, but that's what we would expect. Amazon Code Whisper is actually a good product, but specialized, right, for AWS, Um and, and JetBrains AI Assistant is still in development and just starting out. Great tool, lots of promise, but it's exactly what I would expect. And, and none of the above means that we're still at the cutting edge of this. If you haven't started, you need to start, but you're not exactly behind. So welcome to this. <laughs> makes sense, makes sense. Uh, well, let me keep going. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I just no, no, you that's fine. That's, to, that's great. That quick. Good to understand. Okay, so you get the idea. GitHub Copilot, most popular. It works uh, uh, with Visual Studio, but there's also a plugin for JetBrains IDEA, right? It does code completion, right? It generates code for you from your prompts, from, from the comments that you have in your code. Um, uh, it, it offers code suggestions. It even generates unit tests, and I'll be demonstrating that in just a little bit. And it works with many languages, Python, C Sharp, right? Java. Uh, the, the list of languages supported by GitHub Copilot is impressive and it's growing. Okay, so uh, Code Whisper I mentioned is specialized in a, a little bit for uh, AWS, right? It's part of Amazon's Q developer suite, right? And they have plugins for both of the popular IDEs that are out there. And it pretty much does what the other does as well. One feature that it has that's pretty cool, it does security vulnerability scanning. It looks through your code to see if you've made any security mistakes. For example, burying a password in code, it would catch, right? Um, uh, so, so there are, you could imagine that's a more important feature, critical feature for writing AWS API code where you're going back and forth to the public cloud. But okay, um, uh, the last one that I'll talk about here is uh, JetBrains AI Assistant. This is brand new. In fact, it's still in development. And the cool feature about it is that it uses two large language models to generate its code. It uses OpenAI and Google's Gemini to help generate the code. And it tries to give you the best of both when it outputs the code. So they're not going to be dependent on a single large language model to get the code generated. So it, it's, you know, JetBrains would argue that they understand the overall development process better than anyone, and their AI assistant will integrate with that and prompt you through the entire development's life cycle rather than just the coding cycle. So a 
again, a lot of promise there. Okay, and we've already gone through now this audience poll. This would have been the time. Which of these tools, if any, are you using? And we know the answer to that, okay? All right, um, moving on, right? How do I actually do this? How do I use an AI coding assistant? And so these are gonna be a series of slides and demos, right? I'm gonna see this in practice. And for this presentation, I had to choose an IDE and a coding assistant because obviously we can't go through three of them in the time that's available here. And the choice that I made was to use Visual Studio Code as an IDE and to use GitHub Copilot as the coding assistant. Um, uh, after you, you, know, you have VS Code installed, that's an easy one, right? You simply add the extension for GitHub Copilot. So if you had Visual Studio Code opened up, and you clicked your extensions button, you would see that you can search for GitHub Copilot and you should see a couple of extension options, right? The core of GitHub Copilot is installed with this first option and the chat window and advanced chat with Copilot is the second extension. So you would want to install both of those extensions. Easy enough, right? So I'm already installed, but that's how you get it in. And that's where my, um, uh, demos will uh, be uh, occurring from. By the way, from within uh, GitHub Copilot, you can choose uh, in the pull down window here, you can choose, see this, we're using GPT 4.0. You can choose other large language models like Claude, Claude Sonnet. This is still in preview, but you might want to experiment with it if you want different code generated perhaps more sophisticated and appropriate code, right? Or you can use O1 mini versions, right? Again, these others are in preview, but over time, Microsoft and, and uh, uh, GitHub will be uh, modifying this list, giving us more options and better options. But you can see the LLM can be swapped out on, on GitHub Copilot. Jerry, have you okay. had experience working with uh, obviously hosted ones work with GitHub, but what about private or repos that may not be attached to the to, to GitHub directly? Yeah, so so first of all, Microsoft has talked about that. Let's say I work for a, a credit card company and and we have special coding rules. And so I want to influence, I want a modified version, right? An augmented version of an LLM that better suits the requirements of the company I'm in. You know, at the at the moment, to my knowledge, Chat GPT, I'm sorry, uh, uh, GitHub Copilot doesn't offer that option, but it it uh, that Microsoft has said that they plan to add that because that's a clearly a desirable feature, right? Okay, great question. All right, so here's my demo, right? Let, I'm going to program in Python, uh, probably the best choice for a language with a group of a few hundred people in the room, right? Most of us are going to either know Python well or certainly have dabbled in it. And, you know, if we, we've all been through an object-oriented class before, so how do we always start an object-oriented uh, uh, training session? We always start with a couple of typical classes, a bank account class, an employee class. If we start with a bank account class, right? We uh, add in methods for withdraw, deposit, get balance type things, right? Wouldn't it be nice if you could just ask your coding assistant to get you started with a class like that, right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to provide a prompt that just says generate a bank account class with fields for first name, last name, account number, and balance. I'm going to have a file open. Okay, let's let's do it. I'm going to say file, new file, and I'll create a Python file. And I'll put the cursor. Well, it's going to start out on the first line there, line one. And there's my prompt. Hit Control I to bring up the GitHub Copilot inline prompt window. So I hit Control I. 
And you'll notice there's a little microphone where I could speak my prompt if I don't want to type. Here's the pull down window to switch models, right? But here is where I would type my prompt. And so I would type in generate a bank account class, right? With those fields. And I hit enter or the arrow to send and dispatch this. And look what it does. It generates a sample class for me. I look at this. This is a Python. This is Python. It figured out the file from the file name extension that I was in Python. And it generated this new class called bank account. It gave me a constructor. It gave me a deposit and a withdrawal method and a get balance method. I didn't even ask for that. I just said, give me these fields like first name, last name, account number, and balance, which it filled in. It wrote a function called under, under, stir, under, under. And that is a special function, shall we say, in Python that lets me use the uh, print function in Python to output bank account as a string. And so you can see it's just returning a string with the values of first name, last name, account number, and bal balance from the account. This is great. It put It's suggesting that it could put it in at line one. And all I have to do is click accept. And it's in the file. Just like that. Okay, that was easy, right? Real easy. Agreed? So that assistance, great. And that's what this slide is showing you. Quick mention here. These are based on generative AI. That's the way large language models work. And they are, in many ways, non-deterministic. The prompt you type in might generate slightly different code to the exact same prompt that I type in. Or if I type in the same prompt in two different sessions, I'll get slightly different results or sometimes very different results. Here's what I got when I made these slides. Notice the difference. I got, instead of an under, under, stir function, I got a function called get account info that re returned what looks like a dictionary, a Python dictionary, with the values of the fields in bank account. So that's what I got. But again, I did get a constructor, right? The under, under, init function that accepted my field names as parameters and set them in, set those values into the actual instance of a bank account when used. So we're going to get something a little bit different. And my slides may match what you get if you were going to try this on your own, or they may be something yet a third variant of this. Suppose we didn't get an under under stir function. And I'm going to change this instruction now to I'm going to add a, a get account info method, right? Which is what we didn't get. Get account info is what was generated when I made the slide. I didn't get one now. So I'm going to add in a get account info now, right? We'll just ask for it. And it remembers what we've already done. It's got context from the previous session. So we'll just ask it, would you please add a get account info method? to the class and let's see what it does, right? So what I will do is put the cursor right where I would want the new method. Line 26, right? Ready for code. I'll hit control I and I'll ask, would you please add a get count info method to the class? And see how polite I am? I made it a would you, and I put a question mark on it. And then when I click next, let's see what it generates for me. There's a get account info. And it decided to return the data as a Python dictionary, a reasonable choice for Python, right, as, as it turns out. But there's my function. I just accept it. And now I have uh, my get account info method. How nice is that, right? All right, this, this, you know, we're making progress. I move on over here. I don't know how to use this. I'm brand new to object orientation. I don't know how to use this code. I heard about something called instantiating a class, making an instance of a class. Remember, class is a description of the data and code that, you know, we might have zero instances of, or we might have a thousand instances of. We might end up with a collection of bank accounts. 
So I don't know how all this works, but I'm going to prompt for it. Can you please, we should say, can you please, can you please write some example code that uses this, the new class? There's my prompt, right? And so let's see what we get from that. I come back to Visual Studio Code. I hit Control I. I type in my prompt. And we see, I hit Enter. And we see what it generates. Oh my gosh, right? It's doing well. It generated an example usage of the bank account class. Upon further review, I messed up just a little bit. I'll show you what I did here wrong here in just a second. But there's the code it's suggesting where we're going to create a new instance of a bank account by just using the bank account constructor. The constructor will use the under under stir function and print account. Initially, it should say John Doe with a thousand dollar balance. We'll try deposit of five hundred dollars. We'll try a withdrawal of two hundred dollars. Right. We'll try a sample call to get account info. I'm going to accept that. And now I'll show you the mistake I made. I have it indented at the same level. I didn't put the cursor back to the left margin. So this is main code. This is not part of the class. This is using code. So I'm you know, just going to unindent it back to the left margin. But there it is. And I'd also like to point out that it uses the very typical standardized way of if, if I run this file called bankaccount.com, PY, uh, declaring the class is one thing, but should we actually run this code only if we run the account bank account.py? If I import it, I only want the account information. And so we typically put this if statement up front before our test code. This lets me run bank account tests standalone. So they even generated that for me, right? And this there's my code. Good. This brings up a good question, Jerry. It where you pasted it, it didn't know that that wasn't the right place for it. So this kind of implies that you, as the person operating it, still have a lot of responsibility for what's done, how it's done. How, you know, are there That's, best practices for this? That I mean, obviously, this is part of what we're talking about this week. But how do I find out more about those best practices for the query itself? Right. So, so to some extent, I mean, I. I understand your question, and it's a good question. Another interpretation of that question is, have I, have I as a programmer been relegated to where should I put the cursor right before I let the tool do the work? Uh, programmers still have a key role in programming. Our jobs are still safe, guys, at least for the moment, right? And, and uh, uh, you know, the, the best practices for using these tools include things like, well, generating the right prompt making sure that the code you accept goes in at the right place in the right file. I mean, you still have to understand what's going on. The tools are not, we're not generating an entire program that uh, implements orchestration for Docker's containers. We're not there yet. We're a long ways from there, right? So, so yes, the best practices of the language, the best practices of understanding your coding assistant, right? And, and moving on from there are, are pretty critical. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you see what I did, right? I left the cursor here. I'll put it right here. Indented four spaces. And in Python, obviously, indentation matters. In another language, I might not have even cared, right? Like, like C doesn't care. So it really does depend on the language you're in and the way that the particular tool, right? Um, uh, GitHub Copilot is very particular to where the cursor is. Uh, AI Assistant, not so much, right? They've built in the uh, indentation rules for the language you're in into AI Assistant from JetBrains. So it, it varies. Good question. Okay, so you see how, how that, whoops, you see how that one worked for us. It gave us good, oh, by the way, that code should run, shouldn't it? I mean, I don't know why I can't say run without a debugger. We'll call it a bank account, the file. And then see if it runs with the Python debugger behind me. And it did. Take a look at that. There's the print of the account John Doe. 
there's after the deposit of $500, we went up to $1,500. We withdrew $200. We came down to $1,300. And well, there you go. This is good stuff. Okay. Real quick, uh, you'll notice this is maybe something I wouldn't have thought of when I was, you know, going to write withdraw. I probably would have, but might, maybe not. Look what the assistant did. It checked the withdrawal amount to make sure that it was positive and to make sure that we had enough money in the account to actually do the withdrawal. I'll withdraw a million dollars, please, from my thousand dollar account. Well, this is going to stop you. And you'll notice they even defined it to return a Boolean value of true or false. The example code that got generated, at least this time, didn't test for overdraft or over withdrawal or whatever we call it. But the code is there, right? And we could add the test ourselves, or we can do better, as you'll see shortly. Okay, so there's our usage example, right? And some example code that got generated here. Actually, do you see that on my slide, when, again, non-deterministic, when I generated the example code, when I did the slides, it actually did try an over-withdrawal and expected it to fail, right? So if not withdraw, it printed insufficient funds, but not when I just did the live demo. Each time I do it, I'm going to get slightly different results, such as the nature of LLMs. Okay, here's another thing, right? How does code work? I, especially after it generates code, but it might be that you're using code from a, a peer or code that was generated two years ago by someone else um, that, that I'm complaining wickedly about. <laughs> Many times I've complained wickedly about code that I haven't seen before. And I look through the code and I start yelling at the author only to discover I was the author. I just didn't remember it. So be careful what you complain about, right? But here's how it works, right? Um, you can just highlight the code and then use a right click or a command click if you're on a Mac and just ask Copilot to explain the code. For example, here we are talking about withdraw. Let me highlight that function. I'll right click it. I'll go to Copilot and I'll choose explain. There are other options. You can generate documentation, right? directly from that function based on this explanation or generate tests. And I'll go through that. But right now, let me click explain. And look, it opened up another window pane on the right side. So far, we've been using the inline prompt window for GitHub Copilot. Here's the separate window pane, the full chat interface for GitHub Copilot. And look what it said about this. The withdrawal method in the bank account class is designed to handle the withdrawal of funds, right? The method checks if it's greater than zero, less than or equal to current. You get the idea. This is a nice full explanation of what that function did. You know, you've got a more complex function, a recursive function or whatnot. The explanation could really be valuable to you. This is, again, a simple example, right? Read four lines of code and figure it out. But Sometimes this is incredibly valuable stuff, right? This window pane is sizable and we can add more or less to the width of the screen as we go through this. Okay, I'll leave that open and return over here. But there's another good example of, uh, of use of AI when we're coding. Okay, it's that chat window. And in fact, in either the inline or the chat window, Rather than typing out whole sentences, would you please add a under under stir function? You can use for many uh, uh, common prompts that we would be generating. You can use in GitHub Copilot slash commands. And some of them include like slash tests, which generates unit test code for the code that's there. Instead of right clicking and choosing explain, you can just say slash explain. Or if there's a bug, slash fix. Highlight the code and slash fix it. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the nature of the bug and, and so forth, right? So, for example, if we wanted to generate unit tests for bank account, and this brings up an interesting point, right? What's the value of having AI code assistance? And the obvious um, answer might be, actually, I'm not even going to highlight. I'm going to do it different. 
the um, obvious answer, oh yeah, I was going to do the slash command. The obvious answer might be, it's going to make me more productive. Here's the other thing it's going to do for you as a programmer. It's going to relieve you of the tedious tasks that all of us have to do but hate doing. For most of us, that means writing tests. Most of us hate writing tests. Wouldn't it be nice to get some help here? I can highlight the bank account class, right? And then in the prompt window over here, the big one, I'll just say slash tests. And when I hit enter, it starts generating. It gives you its plan for how it's going to do the unit test code. And then it gives you the code, right? So take a look. It's still, here it comes. It's running a little slow there, right? So it, it imported unit test, okay? It created a new class. It's even offering to create a new file for you called, pretty appropriately, test underscore bank account. There's the class, test bank account, which inherits from a standard unit test library in Python called test case. They give me a setup function. They, they, here are the individual unit tests, one for the initial balance. In setup, they created a bank account of John Doe and they want it with $1,000 in it. And they want to make sure that that initial balance is in fact $1,000. See how this works? They're going to test deposit and withdraw. And they'll even try to withdraw an invalid amount. So they'll withdraw $2,000, right? And they want to assert when they're done that the balance didn't change, that it remains at $1,000. That should fail. And in, in fact, they assert that the uh, call to withdraw will return false. All of this is standard um, uh, PI unit testing, right? This is how we do it. You have to include now the framework for uh, PI unit testing, but you know what? There is a slash command to even help you with that, like uh, set up the tests. So we can include automatically the unit test framework and have this run as a unit test. To accept all of this code in green, I would just Click the, whoops, click the checkbox here, and it'll create that new file called test bank account. This is awesome, right? Notice it's importing unit test and bank account for the testing framework. This is awesome, right? What it's generated for me. It relieved me of a lot. And, and it's, you know, if I don't like one test or I want an additional test, I'd much rather add in the one test than write all the code that you just saw, right? So having this generated, an awesome thing. Let's do another poll quick here. So you've seen a little bit of what GitHub Copilot can do for you, especially for the people that are seeing this for the first time, right? Would you plan to use more AI coding assistance in the future? I, I think I would so far, of course. I do, from what you said, we're soon going to get to the part where we talk about what AI can't do. So right. what we've talked about so far, I'm, I'm definitely looking at, into it and, and some of these tools, uh, definitely excited about it. You know, we've had a, a fair number of questions about differences between platforms, differences between options, and how do I choose the right one? So while we give people 30 seconds to finish the poll, what would you say? Right. So... So first of all, you know, there is no one size fits all. There is no, this is the best. You know, uh, JetBrains AI Assistant right now holds the most promise, but it's also the, the uh, most unfinished product out there. So you're going to live with the rough edges on the most powerful tool. It's like driving a sports car, right? It's got the highest acceleration, fastest acceleration, but it uses the most gas and it's not very comfortable. So, you know, so there you go. I like the one percent no there, right? It was just one person, but but still, there there is a little bit of a sometimes a resistance there. But again, we either start to use this or we don't. 
Um, but but yeah, I I, uh, I think choosing the right tool is not an easy answer. Do you need the advanced features? Are you working in an environment? I mean, I, I know a finance company that doesn't give people choices at their company. They have vetted for security reasons, as it turns out, GitHub Copilot, and they don't let the other developers use the other tools. So their decision was based primarily on how well they could vet for security the tool that's there. Remember, as you enter these prompts, right, you could type in as much information as you want. We have a proprietary algorithm at our company that does this, and you describe the proprietary algorithm. Where is that going, right? That's being sent up to a large language model, and, and that may be against, probably is, against your company's security policies and protection of IP, right? So you, you have to think about a lot of factors. It's not simply which is the best, therefore that's what I'll use. There is no best, and there are too many other factors to consider to answer a question like that. Yeah, the, okay. the security is, well, before you go on, the security thing I think is really important to touch on. They, a lot of people don't realize that that model might be trained off of what you asked it and what the response was. And if you liked it, that you're giving away an awful lot of information when you use it. And yes. a, a lot of people don't even realize how much they're giving away to help train it. And that's part of the reason you get different answers every time is the model's constantly changing. So Correct. I had to jump in there for a sec, but continue on, please. Here, I, mean, yes. I, I can't wait for the next slide. Okay, so what could possibly go wrong with this thing? It's working so well. You saw the poll. Everybody wants to use more of this over here. Look, not all the code that this thing generates works. I mean, a good question right now might be, especially if you're new to seeing this, how come Google only, only generated 25% of their code with AI? Why isn't it more like 75% or 90%? Um, the answer is we're not quite there yet, right? So for example, I, I won't do the demo in the interest of time, but the slide shows it here. We could just ask uh, to write code that instantiates bank accounts from a CSV file. It's an easy prompt. This is the code that it generated for me when I made the slide. It generated a new function called from CSV. It made it appropriately enough a class method. You got to be able to call the method before you have your first instance of a bank account so that you can make instances. That's the purpose of this function. It returns a brand new uh, uh, list of bank accounts based on the number of rows that it finds in the CSV file. But look what it generated. It did good, right? It, it generated code. It's not shown on the slide, but it imported, right? Um, the CSV Python library so that I could use the CSV dictator. And it opened it, right? And then it read in to each of the fields of the, of the new class over here. I mean, it, it read into variables and then created the new class based on those parameters. And then it appended it to this list called, called accounts in the end, the function returned the list of new accounts from the CSV file. This is good code, not arguing that. But now, how do I make the CSV file? Oh, one of the things that the coding assistant did for me was give me some documentation. Look, look at the comment. Assuming you have a CSV file called accounts.csv, and assuming it has columns, first name, last name, account number, right, and so forth. What I did when I did this demo was I copied this comment out and I pasted it in as the first row of my CSV file, these column names. And then I typed in sample first name, last name, count numbers and so forth. And I ran the code and it broke, it failed. And why? I had to stare at it for a second. It's because the CSV dictionary reader doesn't accept single quotes <laughs> around column names, right? So just copying and pasting what it instructed me to do was wrong. And I had to have some background knowledge on dictionary reader to, to, to be able to fix that. I would have had to have asked for help on that. I would have had to debug it. That could have led me down an ugly path, right? Trying to fix that code if I didn't have some background knowledge on how the dictionary reader in the CSV package of Python actually works. So, so that's a problem, right? Once I corrected the header, boom, the code that they gave me worked, but it gave me bad instructions, right? That happens, right? So um, the uh, uh, 
point here is that these assistants can make incorrect assumptions, right? If, if, if we're not using good enough prompts, expect that ambiguity to transfer into the code that the AI assistant generates. If you write a prompt that says, write a class called bank account, it's not very precise. You know, um, we should be more specific. What methods do you want? What fields are required? For example, in the slide generated one, where did the function, the method, get account info come from? It was just pulled out of thin air by the LLM. LLMs sometimes hallucinate. If you prompt to ask the uh, coding assistant to generate code using a class from scikit-learn called XYZ, oh, there's a chance it'll use the class XYZ in the code that it generates. There's just one problem. The class XYZ doesn't exist in scikit-learn. And so if you ask it to do something that's wrong, it might do it for you. You can fool it, right? Here's the bottom line, right? Your job is still safe for a while, right? Good programmers are still needed at a minimum to review the generated code and at a maximum to generate good prompts, good precise prompts. That's our job. So but does, doesn't that lead, There's a there was a question there about, is this leading to code quality problems that people aren't actually checking the code? People who are perhaps junior programmers are producing a lot of code that nobody's looking at. It appears to run. The tests aren't being done. The review isn't being done. Is this, and then of course, if that code goes into AI, are we not inherently watering down and ruining our code base? I mean, it, how are we keeping this you know, if, if I'm paid off lines of code, I write, I'm going to write a bunch of AI code and I'm going to have pro requests across the board right. and none of them have value. How do we keep quality in AI? So, so first of all, we've always had this issue. I mean, people that copy and paste code from Google, for example, from a Google search are pasting in bugs that proliferate. What? And we've seen that, oh. right? <laughs> so, so this isn't a new problem, right? The, the, the more we rely on tools, the more we rely on things like copy and paste, right? The, the more we risk affecting our quality and it shows, right? On the other hand, the AI tool also helps you with testing and unit testing. And if I can generate a hundred tests in the time that it used to take me to generate three tests, I should be able to test my code better, right? And and so I think that that, there are two forces on this. One is making our code base, uh, you know, decrease quality, but the other force is increasing the quality. And we hope, uh, no one's making, you know, absolute statements here, but we certainly hope that there's a higher emphasis on increasing quality rather than decreasing it. But both forces are, are there. Both sides of that scale are being affected. Time will tell. But I think you'd agree that the ability to test easier more effectively should in the end outweigh the mistakes that are being made and the LLMs and the things are getting better, not worse at the moment. So that's another part of that trend, okay? All right, what makes a good prompt, right? So understand the, an LLM in general and certainly an AI code assistant in uh, specifically does its work based on something called context. The context determines what information is going to be generated, what code will be generated. And context is based on your previous questions, your chat questions, or the instructions you gave it. It's based on the existing code that's open. If I've already got a project open that has 12 classes in it that deal with employees, it's picking up a lot of context from that open code, the open files with the code that's there. So all the tabs that are open in the IDE are part of the context for what the AI code assistant is going to do, right? Fortunately, in GitHub Copilot, they will show you the references beneath the uh, prompt that you give just before they generate your code. So, for example, if I come over here and say, uh, generate the minimum and maximum values of balance. I don't even know what that means, but I'm going to hit enter on it. And it's going to go generate something for me, right? 
And look what it did. It showed me that it used one reference. And that one reference is right here. It was based on the uh, uh, code from testbankaccount.py. Okay, which maybe isn't what I wanted. So I want to keep an eye on that reference and say, whoops, I had the wrong file open. I meant to have bank account, not test bank account uh, open. And so I might change, right, the files that are open. I might change my context. When you, If you're working on a large project, you know what you really need to be doing? You need to keep separate context. I'm working on with the class called employees, and I'm also working with a class called surveys. And they're really not that related. There's a button over here to, to create a new context, a new chat window. And you can do that and save and, and switch back and forth between the different contexts. That's one way to get more precise with what you're doing, right? So there's that. Um, how do I improve the context with better prompts, right? So if you just say, you know what I did, I almost said something this bad, generate a class called bank account. There's a lot of room for what kind of code could be generated with that, right? A more precise prompt would say something like generate a class called a bank account with fields for first name, last name, you know, so forth, and methods to access those fields. Add methods uh, to deposit and withdraw an amount of money, but limit the maximum withdrawal to no more than $10,000. Put your requirements in. If you put that into your prompts, guess what you're going to get? Code that matches the requirements. Leave it out, and who knows what you're going to get. There's an old adage, right? You get what you manage for. And if you, you know, don't ask for the right things, you don't ask for enough, then you're not going to get the proper results. You don't tell your employees, right? Be sure you're here at eight, and you must stay until five. Why not? Because that's all you'll get, <laughs> eight to five employees, right? And so we need to be careful here with these prompts. Be precise. Remember, there's context behind it. Another little thing here, use good punctuation with the prompts, right? This is a not often talked about feature, but the LLMs are trying to figure out your intent. What are you really asking for? What's What kind of, if you go back and you study the questions, you realize, I really was assuming they can figure things out. If you add punctuations like question marks and commas, you'd be amazed. I mean, it's like using parentheses when you use commas, right? It's a big difference between three plus five times six, depending on where you put the parentheses. And, and the same thing is true here for LLM, right? So just uh, be aware of the ambiguity in your prompts and it will really help with what's there. Okay. Um, All right, so shall we look at the uh, question? So, so there are, are, are the uh, slides that I have to present, but I think now might be a good time to go through the Q&A and we'll see if the panel here can yeah, address some I've, of these. I've been typing some of the answers oh, so far, trying to, trying to keep up with it. Um, there's some, some other ones out there, for example, uh, cursor, cursor AI, um, you know, a lot of them are like differences between this tool and that. What are your thoughts on cursor? Uh, it's a great tool. I think it's yet another up and coming tool that, you know, could, uh, uh, uh make a big impact or, you know, who knows, right. You're going to see mergers obviously in some of these tools. I don't think we need 200 different coding assistants in the future. And if I had to place my bets, I'm suspicious that the companies with the deep pockets are going to be the winners, but whether it's Google or Microsoft or Apple or whoever it might be. I mean, JetBrains isn't bad either, but they have some stiff, heavyweight competition above them. You understand, right? I of think course. everybody in here understands. Um, they, which kind of leads into one of the, the other questions. Since the AI models are constantly being retired and new ones are being formed and they're being trained with different information. Uh, and as we've learned, there's issues sometimes with hallucination and bad data going in. What will, what's going to cause the, the angle of, of trajectory to go towards quality uh, instead of problems? Like how are we, how are we keeping it from getting progressively worse with bad data being inserted? I mean, 
it's already being spiked. You know, people with their their photos being stolen are now spiking it with bad AI data to to mess up the 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 content. So how are we going to stop that in this space? Yeah. So in this space, again, that's one of the reasons that the companies with deep pockets are more likely to win. They can throw more people at it to do better filtering. We're also using AI to check AI. And so all of these models, are, for example, uh, we're using a technique whereby the code that's generated is checked for accuracy, right? I mean, the, the, the miscomment was probably hard for, the, for any tool to catch, right, that I showed earlier. But, but by and large, right, the way this is going to work is that the companies that succeed are the ones that generate good code, fewest mistakes. And the way they're going to do that is by throwing more resource at it, more people and more AI checking on the code that is generated. It's not that hard to check the code, right? If when they can start generating unit test code automatically, like you just saw, we, 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 you can see the, the validation can start itself start to be automated. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, we have about three minutes left. Uh, in, and we still have a few questions, but in general, um, if I want to do more, I want to learn more, I want to make great prompts with the stuff that you've said, what are things that I can do today to start whichever tool it is, whichever platform, how do I start get started with great prompts? Right. So, I mean, first of all, start, right? Don't sit there and think, I need to go read a book first on generating good prompts. Just start prompting. And do it not in a production environment, obviously. Just do it on some sample project of yours. Try the simple prompts and see what's good and, more importantly, what's bad about what you just did. Then use some of the tips that I gave. Use better punctuation. Give longer prompts to increase the context. Learn how to uh, uh, leave the right files open in tabs so that more context, more appropriate context can be filled in. And basically just practice with it. How do I learn a new programming language? If I'm new to the Go programming language, how do I learn it? Do I just get thrown into the middle of a Go project and I'm expected to be productive? Okay, that's a bad question because that is what happens. But, but here's how it's supposed to work, right? I mean, we're supposed to go and explore the language on our own and write a bank account class and see how that works in Go. Classes and go. But, but you get the idea, right? We would use the language to become familiar with it. In this case, you use the AI coding assistant to know what it can and can't do. Find the limits within your own context is what I would say to that. Okay. So. Sounds good. Which, Sounds good. Yeah. There's a last question there. Which tool is checking? Is it built in? What is it checking against? No, it's not built in. I'm saying that the People that produce the models, Microsoft, GitHub, Copilot, they are constantly accepting feedback from the code that they generated. And they are, uh, are running tests. They build, usually with AI, tests against the code that they generated. And the results of those tests help them improve the code that they generate next time for similar prompts. That is what's going on. Uh, behind or with all of the companies that are producing these tools. Great. It has right. been a, a true pleasure talking to you, Jerry. I learned a lot and I already know AI. So this, this has been very helpful to me. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you for everybody who has joined us uh, for the webinar. I hope everybody else learned at least as much as I did. Uh, try to, to answer as many questions as possible. I think uh, we can hand the, the mic back over to uh, the Linux Foundation folk to take over. Is there one more thank slide? You. <laughs> thank you so much, Jerry and Tim, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a quick reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you.